You know they drafted a quarterback number two overall when we are doing a specific Commander's Rookie Minicamp preview pod. That's where we are. Let's have a podcast. What up, everybody? It's J.P. Finley. It is Beltway Football. We are brought to you by Oarsman Automotive of Virginia. We ride with them. Want you to do the exact same thing. They've got seven locations all over Northern Virginia, from Alexandria to Chantilly. They got whatever you want, whatever you need. So does the big man, Mr. Mitch Tischler, joins me. And Mitchell, I have my computer back. It sounds fantastic. I love having it back. I'm on the rebound, feeling better. Everything's looking up for us. Yeah, things are happening. And in, in that vein, where everything is happening, there's good news all over the place. I had learned something, but I allowed – this is a, a very specific Chris Russell story to break. Are you aware of the news in the commander's locker room? Not only is my Mac back, the ping pong table's back. I've heard. I mean, I, it, it makes sense. Dan Quinn is, you know, a guy who loves competition, and he's also – a little bit more laid back as a coach. It makes sense that he would allow something like that to be in the locker room. I think it's the biggest non-story. I thought it was the biggest non-story when it was in there and then when it was pulled. But here we are talking about ping pong tables again. I, I like to laugh about it and I like to needle the rooster about it because he's like, well, you got to do the little things right. Well, they, they had a ping pong table during Jay's era and they didn't really do the little things right. And then they got rid of it during Ron's era, and they didn't really do the little things right. I don't think the little things are ping pong table dependent. Um, no, I, I think the little things are related to the players that were there. And we saw half the roster get turned over, you know, yeah. without Peters and Dan Quinn here. I uh, think you're going to see a lot of these. Ron mistakes. also flipped the roster. Yeah. Ron also flipped the roster. Like, it, it, it's about getting the right players. And, and one thing you've talked about a bunch, and – yeah, I mean, that graphic that kind of went wild was that there's only 57% of the roster from last year left. I think by week one, that dips below 50%. I think training camp cuts, um, injuries that inevitably occur, like the, the opening 53, I think, is going to be right around 50% of last year's roster. And a lot of that is just because of, I mean, contracts. New- yeah. And we've talked about, you know, some players who have played significant minutes in the past couple of years, you know, are are on the bubble right now. I mean, there are guys who have played significant football that, um, you know, that that might not, you know, make this roster. And you can go both on offense and defense, draft picks and signees. I mean, there are guys here that are going to that are going to be cut and are going to be surprises to commanders fans but that's the world we live in that's where we are right now with this roster that needs to be overhauled it needs to be added added to you know across the board you go four and 13 with no pro bowlers it's okay to overhaul it's 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 okay to overhaul and not to mention that they have like a strategic overall from the top down i mean just ownership putting their thumbprint on everything new gm new basically new coaching staff like i i won't be surprised if there are more changes to come in the front office too. Like generally you keep a front office together through the draft. And then if there are changes that comes after the draft, I'm not necessarily expecting it. Peter seems very cool with, you know, the, the crew he acquired, I guess, but a lot of that's contract driven too. Like there are, there are some people with that previously had big titles and probably big salaries that when the contract expires, probably won't be renewed. And I think everybody's aware well, I think that's not just the football side. I think you have to look at the entire organization because yeah. they brought in some new faces on the business side that are helping to do different things are, you know, specific to the stadium or specific to, you know, advertising or branding or whatever it may be. I think you're going to see some changes over there as well, probably also related to contracts and when those things are, you know, expiring and whatnot. Yeah, I, I, I one, totally agree with that. But two, I live in a world now where I no longer care about the business stuff. As long as it runs well and there's, there's no toilet water leaking and they got a beer sponsor, like, like operate, man, do your thing, sell tickets, be a great franchise business. Like we all got so deep into the business side because it was God awful. And it was a way to get Dan out. Like the more we could talk about how they were the least profitable franchise or whatever, like means to an end, we're at the end. I care about I care about the backup swing tackle. Yeah, I mean, you couldn't be more right, and I hadn't thought about it until you just said it. 
we did get so deep and fans knew so many different names of people deep in the organization that probably other fans of other teams don't know who, you know, runs different things, but because of all the shenanigans that were happening in the organization, we had to talk about it. I agree. We should not bring up the business side unless there's news to be had on the business side like, moving forward. Bro, you, you and I both in, some, in various capacities work for Monumental. I don't know who runs Wizards sponsorship or like Capitals ticketing. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I, I, when, when I occasionally am in like, you know, a whole lot of people are there at once kind of situations. Mm -hmm. I, you know, say hello, but I don't know. It's just folks in suits and that's great. I hope they're all doing a great job. Um, yeah. The suits are important. The the one, the, the two things I definitely care about because they're also football related are new stadium, new practice facility. Mitch Rails did this podcast and every, if people haven't listened to it, you should listen to it and listen to the whole two hours because he's a fascinating a plus human, I would say. Um, but he talked about wanting to build a Hall of Fame, a Redskins, Commanders, football team, whatever they're called by the time they build this thing, Hall of Fame. And how he wants to give kids a free free lunch there, free tickets, a free hat. And it's just such a good idea. But he, he, he allowed that, you know, this could be at the practice facility, wherever that ends up, or at the new stadium. And if you couple that with the news Last week, both the podcast and the RFK news were last week where they got approved to demolish it um, by the National Park Service. It was basically a environmental impact survey, and that wasn't approved and then got approved, um, which they were taking it down. It was my understanding, like screw by screw, which just takes forever and costs a lot. You know, I, I'm sure it will be as environmentally friendly as possible. But if you can just blow that thing up or knock it down or, or, or whatever happens um, in that level of, I guess, destruction rather than construction, it's probably a better term than destruction. Um, Raising. De demolition. Demolition. Right. Like when you yeah. redo your basement, you have to demo first, I think. Yeah. Um, I, I I don't think there's ever been as much momentum towards a return to RFK as there is right now. It's past the house. All the smart Hill people I talk to say it's going to pass the Senate. Biden will sign it in. The NPS is allowing them to demo demolition it, demolish it. Um, I think all of those are huge steps. I, I, you still have to get a deal done with the city. The city's now half a billion in at capital one, which I think is a, a meaningful project to keep those teams in the city. Um, they're going to have to come up with some cash. You need, Cash on the table, because that's what Maryland's got. And and I think practice facility will always stay in Virginia. They got the back end of that FanDuel deal to cement that. But, dude, if, if you were Josh Harris and Youngkin's like, hey, man, I got a stadium deal for you. Could you feel comfortable at a podium? No, certainly not, unless that thing is already signed, sealed, and delivered. You need a, The only way I'm going to a podium with Youngkin is if the lady from Norfolk is coming, too. Like we're all going. <laughs> she's she's got to be all in on it. Also, that, I agree. I, I mean, that that was a, a big stick. What happened with uh, with Cap One and everything? Not a great look for Yunkin. Not a great look for the state of Virginia. Certainly, as it as it as it relates to uh, a Commander Stadium deal. But I will say that the Hall of Fame idea that that Rails talked about, that the team has talked about, the ownership group has talked about, is such an easy slam dunk win. Totally. Because there's so much history with this franchise, not just the Hogs and the Super Bowl, but going back to, you know, integration and, and Sonny and Sam and, you know, all the years of, you know, really like great Redskins Sammy in history. Yeah, there's just so much good stuff to to talk about. And right now, really, the only thing that fans have is when you walk into the stadium, you know, the Ring of Honor, which is awesome at the stadium, but there's so much more that they can do with it. And it's a great way to introduce the fan base to kids and let them yeah. get involved. And I, 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 when I heard that idea, that's one of those, you talk about winning on the edges. The Taylor installation. Well, you talked about winning on the edges with the football side of it, you know, spending money where there's no salary cap. And we've seen Josh Harrison company do that a little bit. This is such an easy win on the outskirts for the other side of the team as well. And yeah. I, I love the idea of it. Well, I also think, I think that mm -hmm. if it's RFK, I don't think the site will lend itself to kind of the super development that a lot of these teams want. And so they'll have the dope new stadium, which is 
whatever that is, 15 blocks from the U.S. Capitol. The sight lines will be incredible. You, you get that return to the city feel. And then if that happens, I think they build the practice facility mega center with a Hall of Fame and a hotel and some restaurants and some like candy stores and, and flag football fields for kids. And that's your revenue driver, which frankly makes a lot more sense because the players spend 80, 85 percent of their time at the facility. Like the players yeah. are only at FedEx on game day and whether like, and, and, and dude, everybody always talks about Jerry, Jerry built Jerry world. And now he's got the star, which is the, his other mega center. Jerry world's only a stadium. It's just super dope. And a lot has been built around it now. Whereas the stars where they practice, where they have restaurants and all that stuff, like you can, these venues can coexist, especially if you get the stadium in the right location. I think if it's Maryland though, I think the Hall of Fame and all that gets built there because they're going to throw. And, and one thing. I think and there's more land there. there. There's more land oh. there that they can work with. You and know, at Landover, just right across from the stadium as folks drive in, you have Landover Mall, which is owned by, um, who owns the Nats? The, uh, the Learners. The Learners. It's owned by the Learners. You know, that's a huge piece of property that's just sitting blank right now that, you know, I imagine that Josh Harris. I know how you hate shopping malls. Might want to try. Listen, shopping malls are dead. Uh, but I, you know, when they when they talked about RFK getting knocked down and building and possibly building a stadium there, just because we just went through the draft, you think about all those visuals of Detroit uh, having the draft. Think about a brand new Commander Stadium, and right there on the lawn at the Armory, and and that you you have a draft. You could fit a million people. You can see the Capitol in the background. I think. I think. One, I think they're going to get a draft in D.C. long before the stadium gets built. I Like, I, I think they could get the draft by, like, 27, honestly. Um, but two, I think – I don't think you mess around. I, like, you don't mess with what doesn't work. You put the draft in front of the Lincoln Memorial and have the whole – yeah. yeah. Remember when they had that – and this is years ago, but remember when they had that, like, the kickoff opener was in FedEx and they played the Jets and there was, like, a concert down on the mall – like, that was the first – if you go back and look, that was kind of the first, like, NFL event that wasn't a game. And I think, right or wrong, the way the NFL wraps himself in the flag, I think they would love that look. And, yeah. and it would look awesome. Um, I mean, you think about the Caps and Nats parades, which were, you know, on, along Constitution or whatever. You set up, you know, a draft there with the Capitol on one side and Lincoln Memorial on the other. I mean – the Caps crushed the parade. I don't know why the Nats wanted theirs different because they, they, the, if you remember, the Nats didn't end up on the mall. They ended up like kind of right off to the side. The Caps was, the Caps was just such an epic day. Um, all right. I want to do this preview. Uh, like we're going to do a rookie minicamp preview and it, it's going to be all eyes on Jaden, period, full stop. Uh, there's a new quarterback. That's all anybody's going to want to see. Um, uh, cameras. I know Abernathy's coming for Monumental. Kerwin will be there for NBC Four. Well, like, like Kendall and, and Chick Sky will like. There'll be more cameras at a probably more than like eh, maybe the beginning of training camp when Harris was there. It was pretty pop. It was pretty full. But there's going to be more cameras at this thing. Like the guys from Norfolk will come. Richmond will come. Hagerstown will come. Bowie TV will be there. All that, right? Right. So more cameras at this rookie mini camp. Probably since Robert, maybe Dwayne. And Chase, there was excitement, but it was COVID. Um, and they're all going to be trained on Jaden. We we can start with Jaden, but I actually have a randomized list. I want us each to say one thing we want to see from the nine draft picks, and then we can pick each one UFA. Sold. All right. Top of the list. What? Jaden Daniels. Top of the list. No, I told you my list is random, but we can do oh. Jake if you want. All right, no, go. To, who's the, who's who are you most looking forward to seeing? No, it's not like that. Like I'm just I'm looking at the commander's roster of draft picks, and I guess looking at this, it appears to be in alphabetical order. Okay, so Brandon Coleman, top of the list. Yeah, I mean, listen, we're not going to learn anything about Brandon Coleman at minicamp. We're not going to learn much about him until they put pads on. Tough to tough to get a read on O lineman. Not in pads, but I want to see his size. I want to see the athleticism. I want to see the quickness. 
and uh, you know, one see what thing, you don't you name like eight things. We're we're gonna run out of things if we're each naming eight per person. All right, one thing: athleticism. I want to see if he's athletic on the football field as he is in individual testing. I want to see his feet. Um, I, he did an interview with Russell, maybe. And we have a real cool interview with the TCU O-line coach coming up, probably in the TV show later this week. On um, Friday, we'll, we'll post it. Um, but he talked about um, in the run game, he kind of fancies his game. Now, granted, these are two eventual Hall of Famers, but Jason Kelsey and Trent Williams. And both those guys win with their feet. As big and strong as they are, I mean, Kelsey's legit undersized. Trent, in the new era of freak size tackles, is arguably undersized. But they win with their feet. I want to see Coleman's feet. And to your point, you're not going to get a lot out of O-line play at rookie minicamp. All right, number two on the list. And you only get to say one thing, big man. All right. You know I like to say more than one, but go ahead. Jaden Daniels. I want to see the arm strength. Um, I'm interested. I know that he can throw a good deep ball. We've seen some of the numbers on – intermediate throws i just want to see how the ball like comes out of his hand in person you know you can watch guys on tape and, and see them throw the ball downfield but there are guys that you watch in person who may not have the strongest arm in the world but the ball just explodes out of their hand and i kind of have a feeling that's what we're going to see from Jaden, but i want to see what that looks like so i was going to say i want to see him throw um i don't expect to I don't expect that explosion explosion. Um, I expect just the ball to always land where it's supposed to. Um, but since you said throwing, I will say after kind of having watched him a bit, after like interacted a little bit just via the draft process now and talking to his father and talking to his agent and seeing his family, I just want to see him with the guys. Cause by all accounts, he's just great with the guys. And to me, it's going to say a lot. Do we have the final roster for this weekend? Probably not, right? Not yet. Yeah, so that'll probably come out like Wednesday or Thursday. For timestamp guy, it's Monday night at 8.13 p.m. Um, but Jaden is going to be throwing to some dudes that will never make NFL rosters. And that doesn't diminish what they've accomplished to get to a rookie minicamp. But, like, I just want to see how he interacts with those dudes. You know what I mean? Like, he's a number two overall pick. He just won the Heisman, like, but his – Hey, everybody's a teammate. Like, I, I just kind of want to watch all that unfold. Um, and I just want to see him and, like, the hype rocket that he is and, and the excitement. Uh, but that was cheating. That was kind of a second one. It's okay. All right. I'm not going to um, call you out on it. We're going in alphabetical order. Dominique Hampton, safety, Saturday pick. I'm going to let you go first since I stole yours with uh, Jaden. Great. Um, you get to go first with Jaden. I get to go first with the Saturday <laughs> safety Saturday um, safety. You, know, you want me to go first I'm happy to go first no I can I uh <clears throat> you, you want to see speed translate to on the field kind of similar to your Coleman thing like the athletic testing is cool but you're not wearing a helmet or pads or anything uh, I guess some of it you are but I, I want like we know about speed in the past with guys they've drafted but it doesn't necessarily translate to football ability I, I want to see that translation yeah, for me, uh, Dominic Hampton's a pretty big body, 6'2", uh, you know, huge, long uh, wingspan. And list them 6'3", 220. 6'3", there you go. Um, I want to see, like, you're in mini camp, and they're, so they're not going to be hitting, but I want to see body position from him. I want to see how he uses his size on the football field. There are guys who have those big bodies that get used to being able to just run through receivers in college. In the pros, you're not going to be able to do that as much. And so kind of – Body positioning when they're going to try and contest balls is an important part for a big safety. Let's see what he, let's see what he's got. Let's see how he how he uses that big frame is it frame of his. I like that. Uh, next we have Jordan. Nope, we have Javante Jean Baptiste. Uh, DN. So this one is kind of contradictory because he played major college football for six years or five years. Like he played at Ohio State and then Notre Dame, right? And the frame has just remained small. Um, he's got a big wingspan he's listed at 65 but he's only 260 this to me seems like a fake injury ir let's let this guy work out with Engelhart for a year and see what we can do like like if we get to late august I, that's one thing i'll have my eye on is it, it's basically a professional red shirt year like Braden daniels got last year um you know that's something else to keep in mind that the, some of last year's picks could be out there for rookie camp 
we'll, yeah, but we'll, we'll, see, we'll see what we notice. But um, I think I just want to see the frame, and if it if he looks like he's just a wiry fella, or if it because you can kind of tell like when a guy can add weight, but he's been in big program. Like it's not like he was at Ball State for three years and went pro and needs some professional work on him. Like Ohio State and Notre Dame kind of know what they're doing in the weight room. But I'm looking at the frame first. Yeah, uh, for me, they signed three DNs who are going to be mostly your every down, you know, rotational defensive ends. And who was it? Dante Fowler, Dorrance Armstrong, and Cleveland Play Farrell. Yeah. yeah, so between those yeah, three. might be able to go out there a little bit. Who knows? Newton seems like he could do a lot of things. So I, I kind of want to see, you know, John Batista. You think Obata's still around? Yeah, I want to see what kind of specialty thing he's going to be able to bring to the field. I think with his size and and – speed Blank. it's going to be kind of the bend and the ability to get to the quarterback to get underneath defensive tackles uh i mean offensive tackles i think being a seventh round dude like that you're going to have to show something you know kind of one particular trait that kind of makes the team for you so for me i, I think for him it's going to be his ability to rush off the edge and and be a, a disruptor in the past game yeah i like that um nobody's making a team this weekend either you know no. what i mean but yeah um you could definitely start the process for sure. Um, up next in the alphabetical order list, which is super random, is Jordan McGee. I've got one, but I will I will allow you to go first as I've gone first a, a few times. Now. I want to see his nose for the football. I mean, that's what he was kind of known for a little bit coming out of Temple. Not always taking the best angles, but always finding a way to, to get to the ball. In these mini camps, they play through the thud. So you're going to see guys kind of running up and two-hand touching. I want to see kind of how well he's able to, to to use his spatial awareness and kind of move around an NFL field. He's not the biggest middle linebacker, so he's going to have to use some of those football instincts to be successful, and this is a good good chance for him to kind of show off a little bit his ability to to get to the ball without having to be worried about being road graded by a 6'4", you know, 340-pound offensive tackle. Yeah. Um, similarly, you know, when you play at Temple and that program doesn't have great facilities and such, like we – recorded podcast from their locker room in the link um that which their locker room is just fine the link's a nice facility i mean like where they practice and everything um it but they have that temple tough mindset and when you get you i, I believe the players vote on who gets to wear the single digit uniforms i have a feeling and i've heard this but i want to see it like that this dude is hyper competitive and even in a situation like this when, when somebody has that gear we should see it so I, I'm just kind of curious on that one. And it's premature for sure, but like you don't pick up Davis's option because you, you could with what the play has been for three years. Right. You signed three linebackers and you drafted one. Like how many are you keeping? Like it just starts to get interesting. Um, and that's that's a August 10th conversation, not a May 6th or whatever day it is. Um, all right, uh, Luke McCaffrey. Um this is an interesting one. I can go or you can go. Yeah, I, I want to see the route running. I mean, he's a guy who was a quarterback who had to make the move to wide receiver. You look at this commander's wide receiver group, and nobody stands out as kind of your number three, your slot receiver, slash your number three receiver on this roster. And there are some guys who have been here for some years. Deami Brown, Dex Milne, to a lesser extent, you know, Mitch Tinsley, Jameson Crowder has, you know, found a little bit of a role in kick return and whatnot. Luke McCaffrey has every opportunity to step in and kind of take that starting right. slot receiver role. And it starts Friday. You know, that's the, the first opportunity we have to see kind of the route running and the precision and the hands and all that. So uh, I want to see him. I want to see how he's able to step into that role. Yeah. I was going to say the polish um, kind of similar, similar. Yeah. But I, I can go. I'm he projects as a slot, but he's six two. So I, I just want to see that frame on the inside and we might not get to see much of it like i can't imagine there's gonna maybe there'll be 11 on 11 but i i kind of expect like nine on nine so you're only seeing one side i, I don't know it's something to watch over the course of the of the summer like once they get to otas and stuff kind of where he lines up and and how you make because what's i mean he's listed six six two one ninety eight like if he tries to turn inside and set his body up for a catch and he's got 
a five-year NFL linebacker competing for that space and that ball. I got, I got to see how you handle that frame, man. It's just, it's a, generally like slot guys are smaller. So the, you know, it, it's the, the throws are low and you're, it's only where you can catch it. And you're just not exposing a lot of yourself because you are, you're in the middle of the field. You're exposing yourself to linebackers and safety's coming downhill. And uh, there's a lot of himself to be exposed. You could say that about me at College Park around two, circa 2000. Probably both of us. Um, what I like a lot, we're going to get to Mikey Sainer still, but this is going to be fun mini camp. Why are you jumping you know, the gun? Why? I'm not because I want to get to. I'm talking about your slot receiver and Luke McCaffrey against your nickel corner, slot corner in Mikey Sainer. So those are probably the only two guys that are battling for a starting position that are going to be going head to head during rookie mini camp. And I, I think it'll be fun kind of watching what it is. If Pete was here, I would go to him for a judgment on if you jump the gun. But since he's not, we won't. Um, I just and- texted Pete. He said I didn't jump the gun. <laughs> Fast <laughs> fingers. Dude. Um, that, that text would have been riddled with typos at that speed. Um, unfortunately, Mike Samerstill is not next in alphabetical order. It is Johnny Newton, um, who frankly, I mean, what you said earlier about Coleman, that we're not going to get a good look. I don't think we're going to get much of any look at Newton. Um, I want to see the, I want to see, we, even in drills, you can kind of see the explosion at the line of scrimmage. I'll watch for that. I want to see the size. I mean, 6'2", 295 isn't massive for an interior D lineman. Obviously he made a ton of plays in college and, you know, was playing through a bad foot injury and all that stuff. I, I just want to see the size and see how well he's able to, to use his, use his body. And again, we talked about it, mini camp, no pads, O and D line, real tough to get a feel for uh, how guys uh, are going to play in games. So you got to, you know, kind of take some, uh, some, uh, some, some side missions to, to, to find something to look for there. Yeah. I mean, just like pain is six, three, three twenty. Yeah. How about six, three, 300, at least listed. Um, yeah, it's true. All right. Now your boy, this is your guy. I, I don't think your guy has ever been a corner. But this is your guy, uh, Mikey Sammer still. Yeah, I, just, I mean, I'm going to go back to what I was saying. I think I, I just want to see the matchup. I want to see the compete. You have two kids who, by all accounts, are, you know, are ultra competitive and, you know, are, are going to be playing pretty damn hard for a minicamp. And it's the only spot where we're going to see guys who, you know, probably are going to line up against each other 11 on 11 when we get to training camp in mini camp with Sainer still and, uh, and, uh, and, and McCaffrey. So it's going to be fun to see uh, kind of that compete between those two guys. I like that. I I'll go size on this one. He's listed five ten one eighty, 180, but dude, I remember when I saw Emmanuel Forbes for the first time, I was kind of blown away by how skinny he was just like his ankles and wrists. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, remember that movie when Jamie Foxx was Ray Charles and whenever, and he was blind and whenever and he, he met him. Yeah. He, like feel her arm to see how big she was like that. If Forbes was a lady in the Ray Charles movie, that would have been interesting. That's, that's it a been all in. Like, it I, all in I, it. I don't know what size like bracelet Emmanuel could wear. Like they'll all just fall off his arm. Um, what size but, bracelet? Do you, do you know what's, are, are there sizes for bracelets? I don't think he can wear a, a regular sized watch. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> he's got to get links taken out to, yeah, he's got to go to the jeweler. Um, so I want to see, because you could be 5'10", 180 and carry it well. Like, what do you think Chris Thompson was, but he was all muscle? Yeah, probably, it's probably, probably similar, probably pretty similar size. Yeah, I'll, I'll pull it up real quick. But like. Chris Thompson also played a lot more in space. So, sure. you know, I, what's going to be interesting with, with so Sainer still being. Chris Thompson was 5'8", 195. There you go. Sainer and... still being a little bit smaller in the middle of the field. It might help him hide a little bit, you know, be a little bit of a, you know, hide from, from quarterbacks a little bit, but also got to make sure you, you don't get lost in there. Yeah. All right. Last one. And I think this is another opportunity, whether we see it tomorrow or Friday or, or more when we get to camp, uh, Ben Sennett, tight end at a K state. I think you could see him and McGee in some situations, right? Like if we're talking oh, about yeah. rookie squaring up or dude, frankly, you could see him and, Sam are still like, if you're going to be in that slot, like there's going to be some tight end action um, for Senate. The, 
this will be like cheesy, but I, I mean, he did win the low man award. So if you look at that, Zoom's throwing up. You see that? Did you do that? No, watch. I don't know what the heck that was. Wow, Zoom just threw a big, big thumbs up at JP. They I like think to you throw this up on the YouTube and see if other people see it. I don't know what the heck that was. That was amazing. I don't even know that I can do that. I wonder, new computer, new me, new Zoom. I don't know. Yeah, how about that? Um, Senate. I, dude, Peters talked about, and he didn't want to compare them to those players, which I think is smart and fair. But one thing you watch, you check and you watch Kittle, and there is a, a grittiness and a desire for contact from those players. And Friday, Saturday, when we're out there, probably won't be a great look at, you know, what all you can do, but like when a player has desire for contact, especially an offensive player, like you see that, you feel it, you can, you, you, you understand that as part of their game. And I want to see if we get like a little preview of that. It's funny because I'm actually the exact opposite of you with Senate, with Senate, because I think we know about his grittiness. Oh, dude, it did it again. It did it again. I think we know about his grittiness. I think we know his willingness to put his nose in the nose in there and block. I want to see what the post catch, what his post catch moves are, whether sure. how smooth he is running with the football, if he's got some, you know, some quickness, some moves, something that he can do besides, you know, just kind of make a catch and then get tackled and be, see how effective he's going to be able to be kind of in the passing game. And, and if he has a little finesse to his game as well. You try the thumbs up, see if it works for you. It doesn't, it, it doesn't like me. I think it's, it's gotta be your computer. Huh? But you have to do it slow. Doesn't do it. Yeah, it does it every time for you. I'm curious what other hand motions I could make and it would do it. Should I try a thumbs down? I'll try a thumbs down. Oh, we got oh. Thumbs down. what if you what if you throw like a little heart up there? I was going to try Dan Quinn's move that we've been told is called the Shaka. Ready? Yeah, let's see it. Doesn't like that. No Shaka. You want the, the Caitlin Clark? Try heart. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, I, dude, you got to go to the YouTube just to see these. What else exists? Um, but it's like, I don't know if I know any others. What about this one? It's over the Vince Carter. <laughs> uh, I, I, those are definitely, yeah. Oh, that was wild. That was wild. Oh, they have, um, they have crying and they have the. No, no. All right, let's. Uh, yeah. All right, um, one UFA each. Um, sure, you can uh, maybe throw a flag on me if you want. I'm okay with it. I'm gonna go Mason Brooks, who was a UDFA last Ooh, year. I think that very much counts. Okay, good. Um, he was a UDFA last year. He was a guy that I was very high on. I wanted to see him get a little bit of playing time at the end of the year last year. That didn't happen. I ex I would expect him to be there on Friday. I guess we'll see when we get the full roster, but he's a guy that when you look at turnover, um, on the, especially on the interior of the offensive line, it's going to be interesting to see how this whole thing plays out. And he's a guy that I think, uh, you know, might be able to give, you know, maybe somebody like Chris Paul a run for his money uh, in the back end of that, uh, that guard rotation uh, for the team. I've been told that late in the year, there were some folks that were quite disappointed. He didn't get on the field. Um, that was and... just me whispering in your ear the whole time. And beyond you, big man, beyond you. Um, and that I'd hardly reassurances or anything, but like, I think the new group is excited to at least get a look at him because much like the kid, uh, the corner from Colorado state that a lot of teams were interested in, like Brooks was a UFA that you had to compete for last year. Um, yeah. and they competed and then just never played him. Uh, maybe wasn't ready, but you're right. Like he's the type of dude that will probably be there this weekend. And that will be good to see. Um, the obvious one's Hartman and, and even the Colorado state corner, but I, I think, excuse me, uh, Austin Jones, the running back from USC, just because kind of of the position, I don't think, I don't think there's a real path to a roster spot for Austin Jones. Um, but they, they only have. Robinson, Rodriguez, Eckler, uh, Jeremy McNichols. I don't want to downplay him, but like there is 
maybe opportunity at the position. And this dude just played for Kingsbury. So like, I, I just at least am intrigued by that and kind of willing to see if there's something like, it, you know, the, the college stats don't pop. He played three years at Stanford and then two more at USC. Um, but he was a really good receiver out of the backfield in two years at USC. Only one of those with Cliff, but averaged over five yards per carry each year. Um, two years at USC, he was averaging like nine yards per catch. So I just want to see if there's something there. And I think it'll be, once we get to training camp and stuff like that, great for him to be watching Austin Eckler go about doing his thing because when you read about the kid and when you watch a little bit of what he does, seems a little more Austin Eckler-ish in the type of role that he played in that uh, USC offense. So I agree with you. That's a good one. Um, all right. I think we're good, right? We've given yeah. you- We have an awesome interview. JP got a one-on-one with uh, – uh, What's that? We've gone from ping pong to undrafted free agents. Yeah, uh, we, we've run the gamut here. Um, uh, JP got a great interview at the draft party with Jahan Dotson. We're going to play that here at the end of the pod. And we'll be back one, for an all-encompassing. Hold on. One little. Here. We've been teasing things lately. Yeah. I think not one, but two joint practices. All right, go ahead. Ooh. Are we, are we uh, putting, a, are, are putting a stake in the ground on that? Like, what? Like a, like a steak that you kill a vampire with? What do you mean? Like, are is a steak bet? No. Like, are you like, you're guaranteeing one, and you think there will be two, or you're guaranteeing two straight off the straight off the shoot? I don't want to say that I'm guaranteeing, but I very, very, very much believe. I I think there was a lot of talk about. They might want to move training camp. I don't know that that can happen logistically in the time frame given, but I think they want to also look around the league. Teams that aren't watching their pennies are more and more doing one, if not two joint practices anyway. Well, and we saw last year in Baltimore and have talked about ad nauseum on this pod, how much you can get out of those joint practices because you get to schedule and plan situational football and you get to work with guys on very specific things. Whereas in a preseason game, you have to hope that particular situations present themselves. So right. I love they're the idea. They're playing Baltimore this year. So they're probably not going to scrimmage in preseason. With Baltimore. They did it last year. Right. Yeah, they didn't play them in the regular season. Oh, in the regular season. Right. That's right. They play Baltimore in the regular season this year. So I, yeah, I think yeah. there's going to be some travel involved for all those editors and bosses of ours um all right do say whatever you so jahan and then we're back next, yo what what are we going to do about the schedule if the schedule comes out thursday there's a good possibility the schedule comes out thursday night yeah the schedule comes out the schedule should come out this week it should be thursday the nfl is being kind of wishy-washy on it so maybe it'll be a little bit later but whatever it ends up being when the schedule comes out we'll have our typical schedule release pod that we do every year um but for now well it's the only thing we can guarantee you is Friday we'll have a all-encompassing rookie mini camp breakdown pod um, to discuss everything that we saw from all nine guys that they drafted, all the UDFAs, and whoever whoever else ends up uh, showing up there. As always, there will be more pods. We got to go right now. We made it as far as we beer.